Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're going to be taking a look at this review copy that I was sent of Zarkov's Adventure Omnibus. So this is a whole big collection of adventures by Zarkov Kowalski, who has written a great deal of short, punchy little adventures, both for Lamentations of the Flame Princess and for just the OSR in general. This book collects ones that were not published by LOTFP. Before we get started, I have to do a quick shout out to the uh, recent patrons who have helped support the channel, including Landon Canalopoulos, hopefully I've said your name correctly, Dice Quixote, Lee McGovern, J.M. Sundin, and Nick Murphy. Thanks so much for helping support the channel, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, let's dig into what we have here. So this is a, a limited edition omnibus collecting a bunch of his adventures, uh, most of which are available in PDF from DriveThruRPG for fairly cheap, usually in the 3 to $8 range. Uh, this is like a limited edition special thing. He uh, hasn't printed more of these, so at the moment you can't get this particular edition. However, I did talk to him and he said that there is uh, plans in motion to do a volume two adventure omnibus and when that comes out there might be a second printing of this as well and if you're interested in that then he suggests that you follow him on tumblr or on uh, his patreon so i'll put links to those as well if you want to check that out uh, links of course will also be to drive through rpg where you can get most of these in pdf form although i think a couple of them are not available um, outside of this omnibus it's a very high quality book it does appear to be glue bound if we look at the binding here, but it does have a nice black ribbon and it's very sturdy. The paper quality is also excellent. It's very thick. It supports these uh, great full page illustrations that he's been using for the covers of his uh, adventures, which are almost um, always taken from public domain artwork. So this one, for example, is done by Goya. Uh, it also comes with short, um, writer introductions where he goes over why he created this and some of the backstory behind it. So let's get into the first one, A Thousand Dead Babies. What a way to start. Um, so this is one of the adventures that I actually read before receiving this book. I forget where I ran into it, but I was really impressed by how well constructed it was, despite its dark material. It does have a wry sense of humor, which is a common theme throughout a lot of Zarkov's um, material, as I've come to see from reading this. So the basic setup is, you know, let me go to the back of it where there is a map. Now, that, that's one thing that I should point out here. I was reading this and I was having a really hard time visualizing how all the different pieces fit together. It wasn't really until I got to the end that I realized that there was a map. Here we go. So basically, here's the setup. You have this town um, and it's a great little connection of a whole bunch of NPCs that all have relationships to one another, that all have desires, that all have secrets. And then scattered around, you have this big forest down here, along with um, a, the juju tree and the goat's lair, where a evil cult is meeting at night and sacrificing babies, hence the name, and some other cultists um, worshiping a other primeval deity, the fairies, essentially. And all of these things are connected in an interesting fashion, where the players can tackle it in a number of different ways, resulting in a wide variety of possible outcomes. Depending on how the players decide to unravel this mystery of what's actually going on in the Thousand Acre Wood, which is what this is called, um, the future of the town will be shifted in one direction or another. Uh, perhaps it'll fall more under the sway of the church. Perhaps it will fall back to the old ways. A bunch of options are possible. There's a couple small dungeons here uh, that you can explore as you go through this adventure. The layout is done by Jez Gordon, who, as always, does a fantastic job. We have a number of NPCs, and as you notice, uh, you'll see this throughout the book, whenever you come to an NPC or a monster, they're going to come with two different um, stat blocks, for lack of a better word. One is a standard OSR, and one's called NGR. That stands for Neoclassical Geek Revival, which is Zarkov's personal OSR retro clone thing, right? His own personal game for running these types of adventures. Um, I haven't actually reviewed that yet, but I've skimmed through it at one point, and I really enjoyed what I saw. It's a lot more detailed and fleshed out than what you would see in typical OSR um, rule sets. So it looks really interesting. But regardless of whether you're using that or OSR, you'll be set to go. The Lumber Camp, the New Smithwald, the Grove of Titania. We have a lot of 
uh, twists and turns as one NPC will actually appear to be one thing, but will actually be something else. Uh, you'll have NPCs that, you know, uh, try and tell on other NPCs saying, oh, I actually saw them doing this, but then you'll investigate it and it'll be something completely different than what they thought they saw. Lots of great mysteries to unravel here. We have a layout of the little dungeon and we have a wide variety of new magical items and new spells. I was a little bit mixed on this. He does this with all of his adventures where all of the um, spells and items and so on are usually listed at the back. And in later adventures, in fact, each of the monster types and NPCs will often have their stat block at the back, which I'm a little mixed on because it would be really nice to have that in the actual adventure. So you wouldn't have to flip back and forth. I think that would improve it a little bit. It also has one of the best um, magical items that I've ever discovered for tormenting your players. Um, essentially, spoiler alert, what it is is a magical baby basket, like a bassinet. And it doesn't do much at all. It's not like evil per se. But once you claim it, it just follows you around. Wherever you go, wherever you wake up in the morning, the bassinet is just next to you with a newborn baby in it. And it's just a normal baby. It's not magical or cursed or anything like that. It's just, But every morning, you're going to get a fresh, totally normal newborn baby forever. And you can't get rid of the basket. So uh, I just thought that was really funny. I don't know what that says about me. But it's something that you can definitely dump on your players. And they're just going to have to figure out what to do with all these babies. Or maybe that turns into a whole quest to find a way to get rid of the basket. Uh, next, we have the Gnomes of Levnek which uh, similar in structure in some ways. You have a town where things are getting weird. There has been a starvation there. Uh, by the way, I like how this uh, map is at the front of it. That really helps me figure out what's going on. Um, and there's been starvation. They've had a bad winter. And they've been turning to possibly cannibalism or eating gnomes because there's rumors that there are gnomes living in this forest and possibly a member of the town was a gnome and he's recently vanished. Um, and now that this person in the town has vanished, villagers who were after him have also started vanishing. So a good hook here is perhaps the leader of the town asks the NBCs to investigate what's going on, what happened to these people, and perhaps hunt down those gnomes and uh, take revenge for the trouble that they have been causing in the town. However, like all Zarkov uh, adventures, is not what it appears. The gnomes are very different than you would expect. They are not typical D&D &D gnomes, and in fact, is probably the best version of gnomes that I've seen, since I just don't like gnomes. I don't understand why they would even be in Dungeons and Dragons, but this takes them and makes them their own thing and makes them much more gameable and much more funny than you would typically see. We have a similar structure where you have the town and a bunch of NPCs laid out here with their connections to one another, uh, recent events in the town. And then we get into the woods. We have a wizard tower. We have a temple along with some cultists there that you can run into. We have a cool dragon. And then we have the gnome village. So basically the task is going to be to find the gnome village. So you're going to have to explore around the forest. And you're going to run all into a lot of weird random encounters that are, going to, that are going to send you off on little side missions um, before you finally find the gnomes. Now, one thing that I am, again, hung up on a little bit on these adventures is the way that the twists are set up. Because in a sense, it makes sense that the twists and the weird stuff is put near the end because it makes for an interesting reading experience where you're reading the adventure and you're like, what is going on? How does this make sense? And at the end, it all suddenly comes together and you go, oh, that's really clever. Um, but on the other hand, as you're reading it from the beginning, it, it does make things confusing. I read through this whole adventure and it was only at the end that I sort of got it. And then I had to reread it again so that things would all fit together in my head. Um, and I wonder whether that is the best way to set up adventures like this. It would take out a lot of the suspense, but I think I would prefer all the secrets just given to me right at the beginning. Because as a GM, that's going to make me uh, have a much easier time remembering what's going on. And it's going to make it less work for me. Um, basically, the twist in this one is that uh, the gnomes want to be eaten. Part of their lifestyle or their life cycle is that as they get older, they get increasingly delicious. And at a certain point, they need to be eaten. And if someone does eat them, then they will start acquiring gnome points. And when you get enough gnome points, you just explode in a puff of smoke and your body weight in new gnomes appears. And the gnomes aren't like little hobbits. They're basically like garden gnomes, which I think is the best way to do gnomes. They're basically uh, humanoids that are also funguses. Like that's not a hat. That's actually part of their head. 
there's a whole society, a whole ecosystem built up around these gnomes and how they actually work and what they're actually up to. One interesting little mechanic that I see Zarkov using in a bunch of these is this system where to do random encounters, you roll a d4, a d6, and a d8 at the same time. And so that tells you where um, your encounter happens, what you encounter, and anything weird that's going on there. So that's really nice. But also, if you roll triples or doubles, or you roll the maximum of 18, right, all three of those dice added together, then you can get special effects. So it's a great way of compacting a lot of variety into one little roll. It's very clever, and he used it to great effect throughout all of these adventures. We have all of our spells here at the end, and stats for the monsters right here. Uh, there's quite a few adventures in here, so I'm probably going to have to go through these fairly quickly in order to get through it in time. Uh, next one is a short one called The Scourge of the Tick Balong, which is, I think, not available in PDF form uh, that I could see. But it's one of his adventures that is not necessarily magical, because you see that as a theme in a lot of his adventures, where you could run it just as a non-magical adventure set in a historical era. And that's a really interesting thing to see, especially the way it approaches OSR, um, the OSR playstyle, and creating interesting situations that players can unravel um, without using you know, wizards and dragons and so on. The general idea here is that there is a town and a woman in the town claims that she has been attacked by a strange beast and you are required to investigate what is actually going on here. But of course, there may not actually be a real beast. I suppose you could actually add one in if you wanted to, but it's more about human connections and the lies that humans tell and the monsters that societies create in order to patch over the things that they don't want to see or the way that they deal with trauma by creating myths. This one is set in um, a non-European setting, which is really great to see. It appears to be, I think, Southeast Asian. That's the impression that I got. Our next adventure is Under the Waterless Sea. And the author explicitly calls out the fact that he was trying to create a good underwater adventure, since that's one of those um, goals that a lot of people have, but it's really hard to do well. His solution is really interesting. What he does is he takes... Um, the idea of exploring underwater and he adds a magical effect where basically you if you go through this gateway on the beach if you travel through this gate then physics changes for you and water is essentially air but it's only for you so um what you can do is you walk through the gate and you just march down down the beach into the ocean and you just walk along the bottom of the sea you don't float um you don't feel any water it is in fact like air you can bring torches with you if you want it's totally fine. You come across an underwater civilization, you can burn it down underwater, right? It doesn't make any sense, but that's the way the magic works. It creates a, a contradictory version of events that's happening at the same time as normal physics. It's interesting to see how he pulls that out or he pulls that off. This is one of the longer and more complex ones. Basically, it's set in Hawaii or something very similar to Hawaii. And the uh, kingdom there is dealing with a invasion of these uh, deep ones, right? Essentially Cthulian um, fish, fish people from a deep city underwater off the shore. And they have laid siege to it and they are attempting to sack it and burn it down. So you sort of enter the situation while this is going on. And so there's all sorts of chaos on the islands. A black market has been set up with people trying to uh, exploit the chaos. And of course, you can take advantage of it yourself and head underwater to deal with these creatures. You have underwater random encounter tables. We have this D4, D6, D8 uh, system that we've seen before, where rolling doubles or triples will create special effects that you can have. And we have some maps of the underwater city that you can explore and try and clear out. Here we go. There's also a situation where we have the Deep One Citadel, where there is a number of humans that are holed up there, and you can try and rescue. One thing, I had a little bit of trouble trying to figure out exactly how all of the things worked um, in terms of the layout. Maybe doing this isometrically would have helped a little bit, but I had a hard time picturing it. That's a general criticism I have, not only of these adventures, but of a lot of adventures that rely on detailed descriptions and connections between different areas um, that 
you'll often have a map in one place and then a long descriptions of everything going forward. It would be very helpful if you had mini maps relaying exactly where everything was, even with arrows or little notes or something like that. It would be really helpful, right? For example, um, you could make this slightly larger and then just have actual notes written in the white space describing what's going on there. Would have dramatically sped up comprehension, I think. Uh, same criticism for most of these, right? You could easily have little notes, even in very small font, would be totally fine, written along here to dramatically speed up understanding it. Um, this is much more detailed than a lot of his adventures because it is, you know, going through a room by room or building by building setup in this under, underground city, looting it for treasure and fighting stuff that's there. We're going to skip ahead a little bit. A number of different rooms and layouts that you can get into. And as we see in a lot of his adventures, it very much is dependent on what the players want to do. There is not one canonical ending, which is great. I love to see that in adventures. It, instead, it has lots of notes on what could happen depending on what the players do. What are the long-term consequences of their action? For example, you could have a deep one victory. and, and there could have a, So as you do this adventure, there's a score for humans and a score for deep ones, depending on how well they're doing and how you aid or hinder one side or another. And that can help determine the exact outcome of the adventure by the end. Spells and magical items are at the end, along with um, stats for the monsters, I believe. I don't think they're there for that one. Yeah, here's the general layout. You have your island with the city, then you have a portal that you can walk through, and then you can march down with your army under the ocean and try and burn down a city beneath the waves. The Trail of Stone and Sorrow. This is one of the shorter, it's only a couple of pages long, but it's a great little concept. It's something that you can just drop into a normal campaign world if you want to have a little investigative mystery for players to deal with. Basically, what people have been noticing is that there's some sort of large beast that's sort of like a wild boar with lots of weird tusks. Um, there's the general picture of it. That's been running around the, the area and acting very strange. It's been attacking people. It's been running away from people. No one can really figure out what's going on. Uh, they've also been finding stone statues. So this clearly has some sort of petrifying ability. And the players simply have to figure out what's going on and try and stop the beast. However, there is a twist because there's always a twist. And the twist is that not only does it turn creatures into stone, but right before it turns them into stone, it switches minds with it. So if this beast looks at a human being, the beast's mind goes into the human, the human's mind goes into the beast, and then the victim is turned to stone. So now there's a human mind running around in this. Then if he accidentally looks at, say, a dog, this turn takes on the mind of a dog, and the human mind goes into the dog, and then the dog is turned to stone. So you end up with all of these statues all over the valley, and this very powerful um, fossilized, not fossilizing, uh, petrifying monster running about with a constantly switching brain. Its mind is constantly changing, its behavior is constantly changing. So your question by the end is, what do you do with this? Whose mind is in it right now? Are you going to kill them? Is there a way to try and save it and get it out? Um, what are you going to do with all the stone statues? Is there a way to return them back to human or back to their original form? And if you do turn them back to the original form, are they going to still have the wrong mind inside? So lots of interesting tactics and strategies that you could use to deal with this. I really like it. It's short, it's punchy, and it's interesting. The Gem Prison of Zardax is a puzzle dungeon. So this takes place uh, inside a interdimensional space full of lots of weird uh, rooms. And the rooms reconfigure themselves very frequently. So whenever you go into a room, the way back can change. Now there's ways to manipulate this. So for example, if you hang out in one room while your friend hangs out in another room, then the space between them will lock into place. But if you go both into the same room, then your exits will start scrambling and you're not going to know where you're going to end up. So with some clever play, you can kind of force the labyrinth to take on a certain shape and sort of try and lock it into place if you use enough PCs properly. Um, but if you do things wrong, then you could get very lost in here as you scramble around and try and figure out how to get out. It does have a canonical way of exiting. The author does say that there is a non-canonical way of getting out, but he doesn't tell you what it is, which I guess is fitting because it is a puzzle dungeon. Um, every single room has this symbol 
on its doors that go along with it. Um, and these symbols are apparently a clue as to what is actually going on in that room. Um, I was not able to figure it out, to be perfectly honest. And I read the adventure. So it is clearly a very complex puzzle, although it is apparently not absolutely necessary for you to figure that out to solve it, although it can help. So if you have players that really like code breaking and dealing with symbols, then they could really like it. Uh, lots of variety in the rooms, and we have some rooms that th throw uh, a twist onto how the rearranging rooms uh, work. A great strategy that the author points out is that what you can probably do is roll a d20, because there's 20 rooms. You can roll a d20 a whole bunch of times before the adventure starts. Uh, that way you don't have to sit there rolling a die whenever players move to a new room. You have all the numbers written out and they won't realize, at least for a while, that it's totally random. They'll think that there's some strategy there because you're just reading out you know, what room comes next. Uh, a variety of weird enemy types that have been trapped into this dungeon. We have some weird puzzles like we have. Um, so this room's walls have piston driven mashers that come together every X intervals. Every masher is different. Near the door at the following words in Elven, test your luck. On the other side of the mashers, which causes instant death, is a lever with the words, with the words above and below. It's currently in the up position. So this can affect another room. So you have to run this gauntlet. And I suppose every uh, interval, maybe like every couple of seconds, you, you, the uh, game master could keep track of which one was currently smashing. So the players could have to watch it for a while and try and figure out the best way through. Um, or perhaps um, use them as a spell or items to try and jam the blocks. Lots of great little puzzles like that um, all spread around here, along with some very weird and unusual monsters. As you can see, all of the art is done by Scrap Princess with a very distinctive style. And I think it fits the environment really well. The exit is less tricky than I would have liked. Um, basically, you can find um, a fairly obvious way out uh, once you find the right items. Or I think you can use a lot of brute force if you really want to, although that's not really advisable. It might be a great idea to read this and come up with some other tricky problem that they have to solve. Perhaps configure the rooms in a specific way or something like that um, if you want to add a more of a puzzle element to this. Really, if you explore the, the whole environment very thoroughly, you're going to be able to get out eventually. I don't think players can be stuck there forever. A lot of cool monsters. The back here, the giant silver-faced grub, cat-headed elf, giant silver wasps, giant eyes. So creatures from all across the multiverse with all sorts of weird and inhuman motives have been imprisoned here. And lots of weird treasures. So you can probably tempt your players to jump into the gem prison if they're really hungry for treasure. And we have a summary of all of these symbols at the back. I assume so that you can probably uh, maybe cut them out. If you can photocopy this, cut them out and hand them to the players because you don't want to accidentally draw them wrong for the players. The Price of Evil is a really interesting one. So this is kind of a spin on another adventure that Zarkov did for Lamentations of the Flame Princess. He famously did one where it created a Cthulian town where weird monsters were living, but it would randomize itself every time. And what this is, is it's a randomized haunted house. Basically, the players have acquired a house, but surprise, it's haunted. You want to sell that house, you're going to have to try and clear it out of the evil within. And basically how it works is that it comes with this layout for the cellar, the main floor, the upper level, and the tower. And you use a deck of cards. So you shuffle your deck, and you're going to put them on each of those locations. The connections are already laid out for you. But depending on which card goes where, it's going to create a uh, unique haunted house. So if you place a queen in a, in a certain area, it's an art studio, and then the actual suit is going to change special things about it. So every time you lay out this house, not only will the configuration be different, but each of those uh, different uh, locations are going to have a different twist on them. There's a great use of decks of cards, which I think most role-playing games don't use enough because they're so physical that you can simply lay them out and it's almost like a map that you're actually creating on the table. Moving on towards the end here, 
So one great thing about this is the way that he does use colored words. We see this more and more as these adventures go on. So the color of the um, words here indicate special things about it. So if it's yellow, that seems to indicate uh, treasure. Whereas green, I think indicates, well, let me check it out here. I believe it's at the end. So blue words indicate secret passages between rooms. Um, whereas, I'm not sure where it is now. Uh, I'll see if I get to it. Um, but we, we can also look for is poker hands here. So the arrangement of cards on different levels can create poker hands. And when you see that, it can create um, what types of ghosts that, that is actually haunting the house. So other elements are randomized by the poker hands. So for example, if you get a royal flush, then the haunted house is haunted by an evil god, the worst possible situation. All the way down to, you know, getting two pair, which would be quarreling ghosts, or even something like a pair of jacks. It's a boogeyman. So we have a wide variety of things here. They come with a description along with how to enrage it, because you might want to make it angrier so that you can draw it out and deal with it more directly, and how to defeat it and powers that it can manifest. We've got some rules for insanity and possession, along with a couple of different alternate layouts for the house if you want to do it a whole bunch of times. Uh, next, we have the Temple of Lies. Uh, this being a, where is this art from? I'm just going to say where the art is from. Ah, Jean Leon Jerome. It's a short little dungeon where it basically has an opium den up top and then a snake cult at the bottom. Pretty straightforward. It has a lot of uh, fairly dark material. And like a lot of previous uh, his, of his adventures, you can run it without magic if you want to because the cult can simply be diluted and maybe there isn't really an you know, evil, uh, magical overlord that they're serving. Maybe they're just crazy. I like the option of being able to throw this sort of thing into uh, any sort of setting, magical or not. Oh, one criticism I forgot to point out while I was looking at the price of evil. Um, the words go all the way down into the margin. They go all the way back there. So basically, you can't read the last couple letters of every line, even if you really pull it out. So that is one thing that um, maybe he could look at if he's going to do a reprint, um, just to try and maybe shrink the page size a little bit, because I really couldn't read what was going on down there. I really love the layout of this one, though. I love this very uh, wide uh, columns. You got two columns, nice big font lots of white space around it. It really reminds me of the layout of like an old Bible, especially with these red letters. It makes it very easy to read, which is great. Uh, I think I would prefer some of the descriptions to be a little bit shorter and more terse, but uh, the letters that are, or the um, colored words that are pointing out special things, like, you know, important NPCs are in red and uh, green, I believe is treasure here. Um, blue is notable objects. It makes things a lot easier to read when they just pop out like that. So that is really nice. Um, and we just have each of the rooms here listed from that starting layout. And as I said before, it would be really nice to have like a mini map, just like in the corner of each of these pages. So they don't have to flip back and forth quite so much. It would be a lot easier to put it together or, you know, put short descriptions on the map itself. The Roots of Bitterness is another weird little adventure that takes place on an open steppe. And you have a lot of refugees trying to move onto this step, but something has been killing off the refugees. And the soldiers or the hussars who are guarding them can't really be bothered to deal with it. So they've hired you. So you're just exploring this wide open step where you can run into lots of weird encounters by rolling on this and trying to figure out what is actually going on. In this case, it is a tree elemental or forest elemental that has taken over a tree and is able to possess all of the trees in the area, which it can send after people to kill them. It has a deep hatred of mankind. It's also been twisting and possessing a few select humans to serve as its guardians and as its cultists, if you will. We have the layer of the tree elemental where you can go in and try and take out its heart, along with some great weird effects. For example, um, let's see here. Uh, the heart chamber itself, where you can try and kill it, has a um, narcotic-like substance that can power your spells and make you a better spellcaster, but it can also just knock you out because it's a narcotic. 
So trying to figure out how to get into the heart chamber and even deal with it is going to create an interesting OSR challenge. Down in Yon Forest is, I believe, the last one. And this is a Christmas adventure, which is great because there is not nearly enough Christmas adventures out there. Uh, I'm not sure if this one is available in PDF form. I didn't see it on DriveThruRPG, but perhaps it's available elsewhere. And I really like this one. Uh, this is one of the adventures that I would be most uh, looking forward to running. Uh, it reminds me of the first adventure, A Thousand Dead Babies, in a lot of ways, in that it has a number of interesting locations. It has a town, it has a fortress, and it has an underwater tomb or temple somewhere else. And all of these are related to each other, and there is a interesting challenge for players to deal with. In this case, that it's almost Christmas and Krampus is coming. Krampus is going to come to this town. He's going to steal all of those kids. What are you going to do about it? Especially if it is, you have a fairly low level party, you're not going to be able to fight Krampus, at least not directly. He's quite powerful. He has lots of spells. He is really fast. And his job isn't even trying to kill you. It's trying to steal as many kids as possible. So he's going to run from house to house to stealing kids. So you need to come up with an actual game plan for dealing with this. And you're on a timer because time is ticking away. It's getting closer and closer to Christmas. Uh, this combined with the bitter cold that prevents you from moving NPCs around very easily creates a lots of interesting challenges and a lot of different ways that you can solve the adventure or at least deal with it. One, possible, one possibility is that you can go to a nearby fortress, which has another chapel, and try and move the NPCs there. The town does have a, a, a church that would have protected the townspeople against Krampus, but it's been burned down, so it's no longer an option. So try and move them to this fortress is one possibility, but there are living gargoyles there that will try and take you out, so you have to deal with that. Another possibility is you could head down to the uh, Winter King, as I believe his name, basically the you know Jack Frost type character, a sort of ice giant that is the antithesis of Krampus. You could try and awake him and have him deal with a monster, but of course there's plenty of complications on top of that. Uh, his home, the Ice King's home, has been taken over by another beast, and so there's a lot of other things there that you're going to have to deal with. So a wide open adventure that offers a lot of possibilities for creative players, along with interesting NPCs, tons of cool little uh, magical items and new spells. It's really great. I would really love to run this, especially around Christmas time. At the back, we have a variety of maps just repeated here. So maybe to make them be a bit easier to photocopy all in one place is what I would guess, along with all of our layouts for the uh, different rooms in the gem prison. And that is it. So this is a bit of a, lo a long review, but we did have a lot of adventures to get through. It's been really interesting reading Zarkov's adventures. There's a ton of variety in them, and I love the emphasis on player choice, giving players a wide open space with connected NPCs and problems, and just telling them, deal with it however you want. Something interesting is going to happen no matter what, basically. Um, so if you're interested in these, I would head over to DriveThruRPG and get them in PDF form. Or you can um, head over to Zarkov's Patreon or Tumblr and follow along with him to get notified when this gets reprinted, if it gets reprinted. Um, I think that's it for today. Thanks for watching, everybody. Remember to subscribe if you haven't sub subscribed to this channel. And check out my Patreon if you want to help support me making more of these videos. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you guys next time.